Hello, it's Dr. Peg here at Elisha Someone Freedom Mountain, and it is pouring outside. Uh, I got up this morning and it was bright and sunny, and I thought, wow, another beautiful day like yesterday. But no, nope, no such thing. It is just pouring, 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 and it's very dark outside. However, the silver lining. When we look at today, we can appreciate yesterday. Yesterday was one of those days that we can look at and look forward to the sunny spring days that are yet to come, right? So today our message is entitled Troubled in Spirit, Troubled in Spirit. And so we have several scriptures that we're going to be looking at, and I'll try to remember to give you plenty of time to go there. So let's open with a word of prayer and then let's jump right in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the rain. Lord, we know that uh, you are an excellent planner and that that rain uh, is needed for the crops yet ahead in uh, our planting season. And so Heavenly Father, we look upon that rain with hearts of gratitude and uh, and we also look at yesterday the beautiful sunshine and the warm temperature uh, with hearts of gratitude and Holy Spirit we welcome you here today we give you full reign and uh, we're looking forward uh, to the lesson that you have for us today we ask that uh, you would keep us and uh, help us to see things with our spiritual eyes, to hear with our spiritual ears, and then to be perceptive and receptive in our spirits so that then we can walk through the week and apply uh, your word that you're bringing to us today. And so we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. We want to honor and to glorify you in your son's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a group, a group setting, maybe like when you were younger at school and there were two or three other individuals who had the same name as you? Or maybe even as an adult, maybe you are at work and there's two or three other employees that have the same name as you. And so then when your boss is speaking, it is difficult to know who, which one of us is he speaking to? You know, the disciples, when we look at the 12, we see that there were a couple sets of names where there were more than one. And so it's interesting because when you study it out, you begin to see, oh, they had the same name, but Jesus had a way of referring to them so that he they would know who he was speaking to, but also as the scriptures are written, we would then also know also. And so, um, you know, I often think about that, you know, as we always talk about trying to relate to the characters in the word that we read about, I often think, you know, as a teacher, that has happened before in my classes. And you have to find a respectable way, right? Something that's positive about that person uh, so that you can either remember their name or their name sticks out to you in your memory as well as the other person who has the same name. So I was really trying to relate to Jesus and just thinking that, you know, as the leader of the group, of course, he knew them all, but in my flesh, in the natural, for me, I would have had to make them wear name tags. And it would have been more than a day, maybe more than a week. It might have been a couple weeks. As many of you know, who know me personally, you know that I'm not very good with names. Now, I'll remember uh, things about you, things that you shared about you. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll remember your face, but I won't remember your name easily. So, uh, in my years of wisdom, I have really been working on that. And sometimes I'll actually, after I, I meet someone new and know that I'm probably going to meet up with them again, I'll find a little moment and write their name on my little tablet. And then I practice, practice, practice 
right? Because there's nothing more disheartening than when you meet up with someone and you think you've connected and they don't remember your name, right? So that's something that we really want to make sure that we work on, especially me. So I want us to first take a look at the 12 disciples. We notice that uh, you can see the group listing of the disciples in Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 19. You can also see in Matthew 10 and then also in Luke chapter 6. So the first thing that we notice is that there's two Simons. One becomes known as Simon Peter and the second is known as Simon the Zealot. And then we notice that there's two disciples named James the brother of John, the sons of Zebedee, who Jesus named the sons of thunder. And the second James was the son of Alphaeus, right? So we've got two James. One's a son of thunder and one is the son of Alphaeus. And then notice that there's two Judas. So we see that there's Judas Thaddeus, which is the son of James. However, the King James Version in Luke chapter 6 verse 16 says that he was the brother of James. Interesting. All the other versions say that he was the son of James. However, the King James Version says that he was the brother of James. And we know that this disciple, Judas Thaddeus, he was referred to as Thaddeus, one who sincerely loves God. And the second Judas was Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. So, you know, like, stop and think. As, as I went back through some of my memories of uh, children in my classroom, uh, who had the same names. There might be this very angelic child who then there was this other child that was like the bully and they both had the same first names, right? So then you had to think, hmm, how are we going to work this through? And so think about this, you know, uh, Judas Thaddeus, he was probably delighted when it was decided that they would call him Thaddeus because Thaddeus means one who sincerely loves God. Total opposite of Judas Iscariot, who is pretentious. Later on, we find out that he had some evil underlying, some things that he did that the other disciples did not know. Now, Jesus was aware the entire time, but the other brothers in the Lord that were serving as disciples were not aware of initially till maybe towards the very end Jesus fills John in on. Now in John chapter 17 verse 12 Judas Iscariot was referred to as the son of perdition. The son of perdition. So I began to think okay well that has a negative connotation and I was like you know what I'm going to look that up, right? You would expect me to look that up and then to give you the actual dictionary definition. Perdition means a state of final spiritual ruin, loss of the soul, damnation, the future state of the wicked. It's not exactly what you wanted to hear, but it's something that we needed to know he is referred to as the son of perdition. Now, looking at John chapter 17, verse 11 and 12, uh, we see Jesus' first request when he prays for the Father to keep the disciples. I want to take a look at that and exactly what that means. Now, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, meaning God, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost 
accept the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, there's lots of good stuff in those two verses. So notice he says, now that I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. So he's praying this entire prayer with his departure that's soon in mind. And he realized that, you know what? I'm no longer going to be here in the world, but these disciples, they are. And so he prayed a very specific, special prayer for these 12 disciples. And so think about these disciples. They've had three solid years of Jesus being right there in his earthly ministry with them. If they had a question, he was right there. And so stop and think about that. You know, anytime that you maybe have had a mentor and then the mentor goes on to glory, we've had that several times. And all of a sudden you're like, yo, huh, hmm. Guess it's time to depend on the Holy Spirit completely, right? And so that's something that you need to think about that, you know, when you lose someone, all of those things that seemed natural, no longer are natural, and you have to figure it out. So relying on the Holy Spirit then becomes very evident for them. So they needed prayer because of the circumstances that were surrounding the departure of Jesus. Think about it, his betrayal, his arrest, his trial, his beatings, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and then his ascension. So they needed prayer because they needed to understand all of that, or at least have the faith to walk in what they did understand and the faith to accept what they did not by faith. And so they needed prayer because they needed to understand the necessary role of the Holy Spirit, both for the sending of the Spirit, but also their constant reliance upon the Spirit. So, you know, we see that Jesus is getting ready to, uh, to bid them farewell, and he's accustomed to being there to give them counsel and defense. And so he loves them very, very much. So you can tell that there's probably lots of emotional things that he's going through in addition to what the disciples are going through. Now notice, and I come to you. This phrase um, was used uh, to focus Jesus' thoughts as he prayed so that he would be conscious of the fact that he's praying in the presence of his father and it was a time for his recognition of God's work on the earth and that his work was almost done and that he was on his way to heaven so you know think about all the mixed feelings that he would have had he loved his disciples yet when you think about the earthly ex existence that he had would he not want to the anticipation of getting to heaven think about that think about that and so he says holy father keep through your name those who you have given me so they needed the prayer of jesus the power of god the father to keep them now what does that mean to keep them that means to protect them not only in the natural but in the spiritual now let me just give you a little bit further on this so to be kept means that they would walk in the continuation of being disciples of Jesus now you might think yeah and so they had three years they should have plenty of knowledge well this is not an obvious thing but in the Jewish world of that particular day no one continued as a disciple to a dead rabbi yet these disciples were to continue to be kept as disciples to Jesus now we know he wasn't like the dead rabbi but if people didn't understand if they didn't accept his resurrection and then his ascension 
if they refuse to accept that, then in their mind, they convince themselves that he's a dead rabbi. And so then you've got these disciples, right? So it is important that we understand so that we walk in spiritual truth. So in Romans chapter 8 verse 34 and then Hebrews in 7 chapter 7 verse 25 it talks about how we need Jesus as an intercessor to pray for us asking God the Father to keep us, right? To keep us. So we don't continue on uh, on our own volition, our own efforts. We continue on because of God's care for us, right? Now, I don't know about you all, but I've had some experiences in life where, uh, you know, it would have been very easy. It would have been very easy to just walk off and not look back and not to continue walking as a disciple of Christ, right? Because sometimes there's things in your life that you, in all honesty and transparency, you don't understand in the natural, right? And we know that sometimes there are things that you're not supposed to understand and that it's not something that you're go that's going to be revealed on this side of glory. But when you get to glory, you will totally get it. So we need God to keep us from division. We need God to keep us so that we remain in unity. Now that doesn't mean, like when we looked at the disciples, they walk in unity, but it doesn't mean that they're all the same, but they have the same mission, the kingdom of God, right? We need God to keep us from error, from sin, from hypocrisy, from pretentious behavior, like what we saw, or we'll see more as we study uh, from Judas. And so notice Jesus says, keep through your name. He didn't say through an angel. He didn't say through a church leader. He didn't say through their own effort. The work of keeping a believer is significant and it takes the name of God the whole character, the whole authority of God. And notice he said that they may be one as we are. So, you know, looking at the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're all about the same business, but they each have a particular role that they play. And now, remember, as we talked about the promise of the Father, Daddy's promise last week, how important is it that as Jesus ascended, that those disciples and the believers were ready to rely on the Holy Spirit so that they would continue in unity. And so, you know, stop and think about this. There are certain points in our life where we experience despair. Maybe we don't understand. Maybe we're in grief. Maybe... Uh, we lost our job. Maybe we're just, everything has toppled. And so at that point, we have the choice that we can either remain and fight it through, or we can take flight. And so oftentimes, if we look back over our life, we see that we take flight when we don't understand or we're discouraged or maybe something doesn't happen in the time that we think it should or maybe it just doesn't happen at all and it's not going to ever and it's obvious it's not going to ever happen according to what we thought and were intended or maybe there's something that happened in our life and it is so drastic that every day that you look at a certain whatever and it reminds you of that event that took place and so your natural takes over and what do you do you take flight you take flight because you don't want to deal with that you don't want to look at that you don't want to be reminded of that every day and so notice he says none of them is lost except the son of perdition. So there was one exception to Jesus' work in keeping the disciples 
and this was Judas and this was in fulfillment of the scriptures Judas was named as the son of perdition he was the one that was destined to evil and destruction and Jesus knew he knew all along even though he had um, chosen him as one of the twelve so I want you to think about that uh, definition that we read about perdition perdition is a derivative of the word the verb perished perished none perished but the one who should perish whose very state and attribute it was to perish Judas turned his back turned his back so when we think about the son of perdition and we think about the word perish you know what is what does the scripture say my people perish for the lack of knowledge right the lack of knowledge so our understanding begins with knowledge right and then it becomes understanding and then it becomes wisdom when we start to live it without having to think about it right you know there was a really neat moment uh, a couple weeks ago my granddaughter was shopping at the supermarket with me and there was a, an elderly gentleman who dropped uh, a bottle of something on the floor and it went rolling and without her thinking without her looking to see what she should do she just automatically ran after that bottle brought it back with a smile and said here you go and the shock on that elderly man's face and then as he looked at me you could tell that he was not accustomed to being treated with respect and so when we stop and think about knowledge understanding and wisdom when we start to act and it's something that we don't have to think about it's something that we just automatically do then that particular area we've got to wisdom so that was something that was a, a really neat example that we could use in our Sunday school class to encourage uh, our young ones that you know it is important that we practice you know you get this knowledge and then it gets in your heart and then you begin to do it and you begin to do it and it becomes habit and you begin to act in wisdom so you know it's something that we as older older individuals could look at the younger ones and say huh she never gave it a thought she never gave it a thought so Let's take a look. Um, you know, if you have your notebook, I'm just going to mention a couple of scriptures that you might want to take a look at this week. So we see that the scriptures are fulfilled by the betrayal of Judas. In We can read about it in Psalms chapter 41, verse 9, and then Psalms 109, verse 8, and then in Acts chapter 1, verse 20, uh, we can see where um, prophetically, right? Prophetically, prophetically. And so, you know, King David, um, we can see the, the prophecy of treachery and the treason of Judas against the son of David. Now, in John chapter 13, verse 18 to 26, uh, we see that Jesus sends Judas away. In verse 18 to 20, we see that he reveals that one of them at the table will betray him. Now notice he begins out by saying, I do not speak concerning all of you. How many times has your boss called you in and he gives this lecture and he acts like it's all of you instead of one specific person this was wisdom when Jesus said I do not speak concerning all of you so they're not all sitting there thinking oh what did I do 
What did I do? No, he continues, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. And so he's, he goes on and he's um, telling us that, you know, I'm well aware. I'm well aware. I know which person it is. And, you know, uh, the scriptures speak to and the, the culture of the time. That, you know, when you sit and you break bread or eat bread with an individual and then after that you lift up your heel against that person you speak out against that person you betray them it is noticed as a great betrayal it's not a little slight um, misdemeanor it is a great thing in uh, their culture at that time to break bread and then to speak against, right? Or to act against that individual. So he says, I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am. And so he's trying to encourage them to stay confident, to stay faithful and to remain confident in him. So he's throwing that out as a way to let them know that yes it's me it's me i'm jesus you know this is all going to happen and so um he's reminding his disciples that you know my work's not done when when i go on in my ascension um my work is not done you're going to continue on and so judas he's letting them know that you know what judas is not going to win my work will continue because you are my representatives. And he also wanted Judas to know that rejecting him meant that he was rejecting God who sent him or Jesus. And so verse 21 to 26, we see that Jesus identifies Judas as his betrayer and shows Judas love one last time. Now, this is a, a really good section of scripture to just sit there and say to yourself, if I were Jesus, Jesus, would I have done what Jesus did? Let's take a look. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread whom when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So he let them know, keep watching, keep watching. Because when you see me dip the bread and give it to that person, then you'll know. And so... You have to ask yourself, did Judas' betrayal of Jesus trouble him? Yes, it did. It says in the scripture, he was troubled in spirit. So even though Judas, the character that he was, Jesus loved him deeply. And it was emotional for him. He was not that detached person. You know, have you ever met somebody that when 
um, emotional things happen. There's this detachment. There's no emotion. It's like you're looking at a, at a wall. That person is detached. That person is wounded because they've not dealt with previous wounds. And so it's a gaping wound that's still there. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine what that must have felt like? So he says, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. So he's revealing this so that they know now who the traitor is. And he's showing them that, you know what? He's in control of the events and he's not being taken by surprised. So notice it says perplexed about whom he spoke. It wasn't obvious to the other disciples that Judas was the one. There was nothing suspicious about him in this sense. And they wondered if Jesus meant some kind of an accidental or an unintended betrayal, one that any of them might commit. And you can see this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 22. Now, Simon Peter uh, motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. And so Peter's question to John, mentioned as the disciple whom Jesus loved, may have been prompted by a desire to take preventive action. Peter couldn't discreetly ask Jesus, so he asked John. Now, let me ask you this. Would that be you if you were sitting in that circle? Would that be your first instinct to want to know, well, who is it? So that maybe you could go and you could talk them out of it. Maybe you could save them, right? Maybe you could go convince them to not go through with it. So notice it says, whom Jesus loved. And John referred to himself with this phrase four times in his gospel, each connected with the cross in some way. In John chapter 13, verse 23, here in the upper room. John chapter 19, verse 26, at the cross of Jesus. John chapter 20, verse 2, at the empty tomb. And then John chapter 21, verse 20, with the risen Jesus at the sea of Galilee. And so, notice, go back to this with me. It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. So the giving of dipped bread designated a special honor, something like a toast at a banquet. It was a mark of courtesy and esteem. So typically you would sit and hope that you were that individual, but not this time. This time you wouldn't have wanted nothing to do with that, right? It would not have been it would not have felt like a special honor if you truly loved Jesus. And so notice, culturally, it was a special honor. It was like a toast at a banquet. And then we see that when Jesus offers Judas a special morsel from the common dish, it was customary for the host to offer it to that honored guest. And it was a mark of divine love which ever seeks to overcome evil with good imagine so stop and think about this you know sometimes we imagine that people are against us when they're really not and it makes us suspicious unpleasant afraid but this was not the case Jesus knew that Judas was against him Yet his love and his goodness seemed to become greater instead of lesser. And so Jesus gave Judas the chance to repent without revealing him as the traitor to all the other disciples. Yet if they were listening, they knew that it was him, right? By the time the bread was broke, dipped and presented, he was already presented. So we see that Jesus identified the betrayer to John 
And that's an interesting point, right? That tells us something about his relationship with John. And so in John chapter 6, starting with verse 64 to 71, we see how the disciples reacted to the radical statements of Jesus. In verse 60 to 64, we see that many disciples turned away. So let's just um, take a moment and look at those four scriptures, starting with John chapter 6, starting in verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. Now notice he says to them, this is a hard saying, not meaning that it's hard to understand, but it's hard to accept. And so some of his words may have seemed somewhat mysterious, but there were parts that they did understand that were really disturbing. And so the Greek word skaleros does not mean hard to understand. It means hard to accept. So, you know, sometimes there's things that we find in the scripture and we're like, nah, I don't think so. But you know what? It's not that it's hard to understand. It's hard to accept because remember the scripture says that we don't think like he thinks and he definitely doesn't think like we think, right? Now notice, he asked him a question. Does this offend you? He understood the offense many of his listeners took at his teaching. Yet notice, he didn't change his teaching. Or he didn't feel that it was his fault. He didn't preach to please his audience. If that was his concern, he would have instantly taken back what he just said, seeing that his audience was offended. But notice, he didn't take it back. He challenged and confronted them even more. So his next question, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? So essentially, this is what he's saying to them. If all this has offended you, what will you think when you see me in glory and have to answer to me in judgment. Better to be offended now and get over it than to be offended on judgment day, right? Now notice he went on and he said, it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. So this could be the, the theme of the whole discourse of Jesus. He continually called them and he continually calls us to put our heart and focus on spiritual realities, not material things, not material things. So then he says in verse 65 and 66, he tells us the spiritual reason why so many walked away. Now, I don't know why, but I've never noticed this before. Not like I did this time when I studied the scripture. And I have to say, it was spiritually troubling to think that he's right there. He's right there in front of your face and he's right there giving you the truths and you walked away. Looking at verse 65, 
And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So he's rebuking them for their material and their earthly motivations for following him. And he's letting them know that if they didn't seek him by the spirit, instead of seeking him for food or for a kingdom, then they had really not come to him at all. So, you know, sometimes when I'm troubled in spirit, I will have to pause my study and walk away. And typically, I'll find myself washing dishes. For some reason, it's therapeutic to be washing dishes. I don't know. But sometimes when I get revelations, kind of like when the, the pastors say that, you know, they'll have a revelation when they're uh, mucking out the stalls. Well, you know, when I'm at the house, it's washing dishes that the revelation seems to come. But, you know, as I was pondering, I began to think, you know, and, and this question rose up. And so I'm just going to ask you, why do you go to the church that you go to? Why? Now, let's be honest. I can't see you. I can't hear you. But, but God can hear you. Let, let's be real honest about this, okay? So, what is your motivation to go to the church that you go to? Why do you go there? I mean, there's numerous other churches that you can choose from, and you chose that one. Why did you choose that church? Is it because it's the weekly social event? It's convenient because all of your friends gather there, and you can see all your friends? Or is it because that particular church meets your material needs when you're in need maybe that church supplies for you or is there someone's attention um, that you are trying to impress maybe you need a job and there there's a certain person that you'd really like to work for so you go to that church hoping that that person will notice you so when you go to an interview someday so you're trying to impress somebody or or this big or get ready do you go there because the Spirit led you there so that you can be fed spiritually and you can walk in unity, meaning that you can be you, but you can be part of the unit to glorify God for the kingdom of God? Now, y'all know what the right answer is. Y'all know what the right answer is. So I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to say to you that, you know what, if you were honest with yourself and God and you're not going to the church where the Spirit led you, you're going there for some other reason, that I'm going to challenge you to go before the throne and to hash that out with God. And I'm going to ask you to get right with God. Right? I'm going to ask you to get right with God. I think it's really important that the the motivation, the motivations of our heart are correct spiritually. I don't think it's anything, we're in the end times, and I just don't think it's anything that we should be um, negligent. You know, if I ever had to say to you, you need to be in the right church, and I'm not trying to offend you. But I'm just saying to you, you need to be in the right church. If you're not in the right church and you know you're not in the right church, according to the right answer to that question I ask you, I'm going to challenge you to get it right. It's time. It's time to get it right. It's time to get it right. So, notice it says, when so many left... So many left. Can you imagine? So many left. What did it look like? In the natural, what did it look like? In the natural, when we think in the natural, it looked as though the enemies of Jesus won. 
but that's not the case. This was the first great apostasy, the first spiritual crisis in his ministry. So his enemies, his enemies left and there were, and then there were, there were 12, there were 12. Now, you know, I, I got to say this too. <laughs> uh, and again, I'm not saying any of this to try to offend you, but to, to shed light to this, uh, you could say that those 12 were the remnant. They were the remnant of that group. And so, um, you know, so many churches are all about numbers. They're all about numbers. Not just numbers of sitting in the pews, but numbers of campuses or numbers of how many churches they've started. And, and, and that's wonderful. That's wonderful. But it's more than just the numbers of how many warm bodies are sitting in those pews. It's about discipleship. It's about helping the people that are sitting in those pews develop a closer walk with God. And so again, I don't say any of this to offend anyone, but simply to, to deliver the truth to you, deliver the truth to you. So today, my spirit says, beware, 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 beware. Who are you walking in unity with? Beware, beware. Spurgeon once said, churches have summers like gardens and then all things are full, but then come their winters and alas, what emptings are seen. And so, very, very important that you get it right. Right, very important that you get it right, because that's the source. That's the source that source that's going to feed you. That's the source that's going to be there when you're in a state of brokenness to pick you back up, glue you together, and set you back so that you can be on track. Right, really super super important. Now notice in verse 67 to 69, the disciples are standing as examples of willingness to follow even if they don't understand it all. Mind you, there's 12 of them. And then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? So he's giving them another opportunity. Last time, last chance, right? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are Christ, the Son of the living God. So he asked them, do you also want to go away? What a scene. What a scene. And what did that feel like to Jesus? What did that feel like? Right? And, you know, Simon Peter, where shall we go? Where shall we go? Notice now in verse 70 to 71, we see Jesus has a knowledge of his own disciples. And he answers them. Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, Jesus knew all along right? He knew all along. One of them was Dibolus. And this is the Greek word that means slanderer or adversary. Adversary. He knew. He knew all along. Judas wasn't fooling him. He knew what was coming. And so he spoke of Judas. So this is a, a simple spiritual devotion of the disciples to Jesus made the contrast of Judas apostasy that much more horrible. And so, though many walked away and betrayed Jesus, 
it didn't change the faith or the walk of the true 12 followers of Christ. Now, if you're looking for something to study this week, study out the prophecy of Judas' betrayal in Psalms chapter 41, verse 7 to 9. It's also prophesied in Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12 to 14. And those will be two places that, you know, this week, study a little deeper, right? Because of time constraint, we're not going to stop and look at that, but you can look at that this week. So, in John chapter 12, verse 4 to 6, we see that Judas objects to Mary's rich gift. And so, we're going to get to see pretension. We're going to get to see that he's really a thief. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. And so, notice Judas Iscariot, it always says that it's Simon's son. Didn't you always think about Simon? I'd be like, oh, you want to crunch every time, right? So, this is the only place in the New Testament where Judas is mentioned as doing something evil other than his betrayal of Jesus, and it was done in secret. So, he successfully hid the darkness in his heart from everyone except Jesus. His outward appearances often deceived, and he had this religious facade that hid his secret sin. And so don't you just ask yourself, hmm, are there any Judases among us? Those that are hypocritically walking in a religious facade, hiding their sin in secret? So notice how he says, was this fragrant, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? So this is kind of an awkward scene. Um, and Judas breaks the embarrassed silence with his sharp sense of financial values, but he had no appreciation of what God valued. He thought that it was too much love and devotion to show to Jesus. So Judas was blinded by his own self-interest. He criticized Mary for her action. And so he revealed himself as utterly opposed to the very spirit of the Lord himself. And so in Matthew chapter 26, verse 8, you can see that Judas was not alone in this objection. There were others that felt that Judas made some sense. And the shock... The shock of what they'd seen caused a brief, embarrassed silence and was broken by Judah's voice giving expression to the sentiments of many. Stop and think about that. What would you have felt if you had been in that audience? What would have been your reaction? I can tell you. I know that I know that had I been there, I would have been a basket of tears. And so this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. And so we can think that, you know, at this time, John did not know that Judas was a thief. And so this was still hidden to the disciples at that time. And so, you know, can you imagine? He's the treasurer. He's the treasurer. But, you know, if you stop and ponder this, 
in one of my moments washing dishes I got to thinking you know what we know that we're told that money is the root of all evil and so you can either be that person that's the pipeline to bless others right for the kingdom or you can be that person that like we read about Ananias who has that pretentious thing like what Judas has going on right but notice in Luke chapter 8 verse 2 and 3 we're told that generous women provided some of the financial needs of Jesus and his disciples and keep in mind that money was managed by Judas so you have to think about strategically in the spiritual you know if it had been a different a different disciple it would have not had maybe as much of an impact right but think about that think about that he is the financial person that's a huge a huge role a significant role on that team the person that takes over takes care of the money and so the verb bear meaning take is in the imperfect tense showing that he habitually carried it and he habitually took from it carried from it so it wasn't like it was a one-time thing so this thing of denying Jesus was not just a oh it's a perfect opportunity it's a first time that I ever sinned in this area no this was something that was habitual money had its he had become the captive of money the spirit of greed the spirit of discontent it had gained a foothold in Judas life in Judas life In verse 7 and 8, we see that Jesus defends Mary and explains what she did. And Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have. And so it was appropriate for her to express her extreme love for Jesus. And he did not criticize her for that. He did not criticize her for that. Notice in Mark chapter 14, verse 21 and 22, we see that there's a statement recorded from Jesus about Judas. And this is what it says, To the Son of Man, who is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Now we do know that eventually Judas hung himself due to remorse because of the sin of betraying Jesus. In Acts chapter 1 verse 17 to 19, he was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. So they called that field, in their language, a kildama, and that is field of blood. Field of blood. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that you brought today, and we thank you. Heavenly Father, that you keep us, that you watch over us, that you protect us so that we remain in the flock. And so, Heavenly Father, I ask that as we proceed through the week, that we take some time to ponder as to uh, why we attend the church that we attend, to look at our motivations, and then, Heavenly Father, that we would... Um, we would uh, submit, submit to whatever it is that you show us. And so, Heavenly Father, 
I ask that you would watch over those that have come to study today. I ask that you would bless them. I ask that uh, you would continue to give them rhema word revelation and that you would continue as they study this week to take them out deeper into your word. We thank you, Lord. We honor you. We love you. And we pray in your most precious son's name, in Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. I'll see you yet again next week. Take care.